That is the Indonesia round of MotoGP for this season. All done. Very dramatic one once again. We keep getting these. These two lads at the front are going to give us these every every week from now on. This week, we are going to start in MotoGP and move on to every topic you want to hear about and move on to Moto2 and Moto3. At the end, as always, you can skip forward to whatever you want. It will be chaptered below. If we start in the sprint, obviously, immediate drama. Immediate drama this week with Martin crashing out in the first lap. Crashing out, I say crashing out. He remounted his steed and carried on. Did exceptionally well to fight his way back to 10th. However, that does not get you a point. So he did drop 12 points in that uh, to, to Peko. And this was, this was really good. This circuit itself, I think this weekend has lent itself to quite a lot of like tight, pushy racing, if, if you know what I mean. So it's, it's not an easy place to overtake offline as, as that we, you know, we've learned is, is quite dirty offline, the circuit. So it's, it's not always comfortable for guys to get offline to make the overtake. So you do have to be quite forceful. A lot of a lot of hard moves went in over the weekend, like really just sitting the bike underneath someone and sitting him up kind of thing. So it really did make for some good racing. I I, I, I quite enjoyed it. And it's it's going to be a weird one because who do you think comes out of it feeling better about it? Because obviously Martin got his redemption on Sunday by winning the race. But Peko, I think damage limitation to come third was, was excellent. Could have gone a lot worse for him. He was sitting as low as six or seventh at one point. Are you happier if you're Martin because you've gone and won the big one? Of course, he's not won many Grand Prix this year. You've got to remember that. So it's only his third Grand Prix win. Until that point, he was tied on Grand Prix wins with Bastianini and Marquez. And if you look at it individually, he's put nine points or whatever on, on Peko uh, with Peko coming third. But if you take it as a whole Grand Prix weekend, are you happier if you're Peko, even when you get to the end of Sunday and, and Martin's beat you and you've lost that chunk of points to him? Are you still happier for Peko as a whole? When you're going to Indonesia, you're like, I'm, he's probably going to beat me here anyway. It could have been a 12-point, 25-pointer back-to-back for Martin this weekend and probably should have been. And the fact that he's come away with a win at all, uh, he really should have dropped a lot more points. So, you know, Peko's come out of that 21 points down. It's not so bad. It's not so bad. What he does need, in it, he can't afford to have Martin go and do that to him, like be genuinely that much quicker than him again in the next race so when you get japan now we do hear about this being a bit more of a peko circuit it suits him that suits the ducati which i guess means nothing to other of them peko needs to have martin's weekend here but you know obviously without the crash so can he put that pressure back on martin can he gain back five ten points you know with a win or two five or ten points if he can pull that back it's very much still game on obviously Five races to go. You have to think that in those five races, you're still going to have Mark, especially, and and Bastianini. Probably, I could see them winning one each before the end of the season as well. So it's not going to be just them two at the front, like, oh, who wins this one? I win that one. You win that one. You crash here, I crash there, you know, kind of thing. There will be other guys mixing it up there, making it difficult for them. But, you know, I went over this extensively last week. Um, you can go back and watch that video. You know, where where are... Uh, the mega championship leaders going like, well, we're not getting battles at the front and things like that. It's not one, two for them two all the time. You know, one seems to have to have a disaster each week and the other one has a, has a blinder. So I know this was a bit of a half and half. So you know, are we going to get to any circuit in the next five where they're both really on it, both really on it without mistakes? It's hard to see, you know, we might not get it at all, which is remarkable. Uh, but yeah, look, I went over this last week quite a lot and, and you know, it is what it is, but you know, it, is, it is really interesting to see how this will play out now because is it going to be tit for tat or are we going to see an actual struggle between the two of them on circuit? I hope we see, for literally, for the next five races, I hope they're both brilliant and they're just cracking on at the front, both of them. It's unlikely. It's it's going to be a war of, you know, who can make the least mistakes, unfortunately. Uh, but it looks like that's literally all it's going to be. That's all it's going to be with these guys. And I think a Peko child at title fight is almost always going to be that because he's always going to make mistakes. As good as he gets, he doesn't seem to be able to push that out of his game. And and I guess where does that leave us with Mark and Bastianini? Does anyone think there's still a hope there? I mean, you can argue that with, like I've just mentioned, with how inconsistent the other two are, it, if they can stay consistent, you're not necessarily out of it. It is 75 points back to Bastianini and 78 back to Marquez now from the lead. What it could have been for, especially for... Pastianini after this weekend probably going to come second there is always the tease with him that he can go and challenge for the win in the late stage of the race 
I personally think Martin always had it covered. I think he had more pace if he needed it. But I think it would have been one of those ones where a classic Bastianini, he's a, I just need one more lap guy. And I think it might have ended up like that. If he'd got close enough, you go, oh, if I had one more lap, I could have got right up close to him and, and thrown one up the inside. Bit like Mazzano too. So I think that was, I still think he would have come second. So let's say he did come second and picked up, you know, his, his 20 points there. It'd still be 50, 50, 50 odd points behind. And you'd be like, he's right in this. Mark, to a lesser extent, without his engine blow up, uh, which was interesting to see. You don't see many of those. But with his engine blow up, he was probably, I had him marked, he probably could have got up to fourth or fifth, but it would have been, there was some really competitive guys in front of him with um, Bears and, and, and Frankie. And we'll talk about a few of those guys later on. So, you know, maybe you could add another 11, 10, 11 points for him there. He's still not out of it, right? But is this a step too far now? Is this one DNF too far? Are they one DNF too far off? Even with the inconsistencies of Martin and Pecco? Let me know. Uh, I personally think they are too far off because I still think they will still make mistakes, those two. If both of them have mistake-free runs into the end of the season, do I still think they can get there? Probably not because I don't think they've got enough race wins in them. I think the other two are going to split the race wins pretty you know, between the four of them, I think they'll split the race wins. So I don't think it's going to be like, you know, he, one of them would have to go and win three or four. You know what I mean? Who else was great? Pedro was great. Pedro was great. Cracking weekend when you consider where the other KTMs are at. So this is one of those ones where it's like, because KTM had an absolute nightmare. If Pedro didn't get it hooked up this weekend, they were sitting in qualifying with everyone outside, what, the top 16 or something? And Miller 16th was their highest qualifier than Pedro on the front row. He's really saved the bacon here. He really has. And it does, I think there is something in this uh, with the guys that did well here. Guys who look good on low grip circuits. Pedro's absolutely one of them. Frankie Morbidelli is another one who low key when you get to low grip circuits does a job. And, and Bez, Bez in a similar boat there, I think. So the, the three of them all did well. But Pedro Costa, just, just highlighting the struggles of KTM at the minute. And then you think of, you know, Br Brad's done a good job this season. Generally, I'd say a good job. I wouldn't say a great job. He's done a good job but really struggled here this weekend and has dropped dropped behind Acosta now in the championship. You can just see if this is what Binder's got. Now, I rate Binder really highly. I, I, I always have done. And I think he's a lot better than what he's showing at the moment. And look, he's still doing well. In the, he's sixth in the world championship. It's not bad. But to have Pedro go and do this to your debut season, you know, can't have that. Now, it does make you wonder, you know, had Bastian, like Bastianini going into that setup now as, as a, I guess you'd say the third rider. Had he gone and challenged for this championship here, like, look, like I said, we don't know if he still will, but had he gone and challenged properly for this championship and even, God forbid, won it, would they have, had, would they have just had to be like, sorry, Brad, thank you. <laughs> you're, going back to, you're going back to race with Hervé. Would they have had to do that? But I mean, it's obviously not going to be an issue, but just say, like the, the form of the KTM, KTM generally, like is the bike bad or are they just struggling a few of the three riders there? It is worrying for them going into next season. They haven't managed to keep that ground that they've made up, except for, you have to say, in some Grand Prix, Pedro's really challenged. Brad, obviously, like I said, he's only eight points behind Pedro here. So you'd be like, oh, well, same thing. And Brad hasn't really been up there very much. He's been consistent. But in terms of outright pace, you think a, a KTM that far off, you'd be like, yeah, they are not that close. He's just been quite consistent in a lot of Grand Prix. But Pedro, obviously, being a newcomer, has been a little bit more inconsistent. But when he's been on, he can get it near the front. He's going to be worth his weight in gold for them over the next coming seasons, you know. if they, it's going to, It could be one of those ones where the only chance they have of getting near Ducati is if they get the bike close enough and he makes up the difference. It's a tough ask. You're asking for a Fabio Yamaha type effort from him in the coming seasons if he is going to get anything. Uh, other things throughout the... I mean... Speaking of KTM and their boys, Jack Miller absolutely skiddling about four of them uh, turn two during the Grand Prix. Got way up on the inside on that curb and there was no saving it from there. Just, yeah, whoa, man, I don't know what was going on. I don't know how he got in that position, but yeah, it wasn't great. But yeah, you'll want to forget that one soon enough. I thought Digi and Mark, before both of them came unstuck in different ways, had a cracking battle in the Grand Prix. I really, really enjoyed that. Digi was just Every time Mark's like, oh, good, fine, I got past this guy. I can crack on, see if I can maybe get myself on the podium today or whatever. Did you just like, sorry, mate, like, I'm having a go back. I'm having a go back. And they just kept going at each other. It was brilliant. I really liked it. And Pecco's pass to go by Frankie. I didn't notice this at the time because he went past him quite easily, but I didn't know. I was like, oh, yeah, good move. Brilliant drive off that one. And then in the post-race interview, Simon Crafar mentions the ride height device. I was like, 
right, a move, something about move, making them engage in the ride height device at that point. I was like, surely if he's engaged, everyone's engaged it. If you watch it back, no one's been engaging that ride height device in between those corners because it's not really a straight. You sort of come out, straighten up, and then you go through through the next one. So between that little kink, before you tip into the next corner, he's engaged. The, the, you go back and watch it. His bike is squatted down, and that's why he goes past him like a traffic cone. Yeah, and, and like seriously, go back and watch it. It's brilliant. So he obviously he thinks, oh, fuck, I can't get past him here. Just squat device, bang, straight past him, and then just tips it into the next one. Makes you wonder, and he made so much time up. Would it have been one where like it would have been worth trying to engage that a bit more often? I don't know. It might have been just really difficult. Like no one was like, I'm not asked with that. I'm not, I can't be asked. It's going to make it worse for me in the long run. I'll try and do that every lap. But it was great. Now, the only other thing, before we get on to the All Japan Cup this week, the first sign, well, one of the first signs, I don't know if this happened very much this season, but the first sign of a little bit of needle between the two title leaders. With And now I say that, it was very tame stuff. <laughs> Um, not much was said, but Pecco kind of said something about, you know, with, with Martin's crash would be a championship of mistakes mentioned about the pace Martin was doing on the first lap. There he goes, if he'd done that, it would have been four seconds up the road. It's just unsustainable pace. I guess is a paraphrase and he probably was implying that it was no surprise that he crashed because of how quickly he was trying to go that early. That speed he was trying to carry through that corner. Martin bit back a little bit. I mean, is it the first sign of a bit of needle? We want to see a little bit of something between the two of them. Because they never clash on track, it never really, they never really, there's never really anything between the two of them. Uh, it's all very like, ah, oh, fucked up today. I can't really be angry at him for that. I kind of, I threw it down the road. Finally, a comment gets made where, like, hopefully they can come together on the track and just hate each other for the last five races. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? That'd be nice. It'd be like the old days, you know, where, where the guys sort of couldn't fucking stand each other, could they? A lot of them. So that's what you want. That's what you want. You know, they're kind of old uh, wall down the garage type thing. Bit of drama. It's not going to make good entertainment for the Netflix series or whatever, you know, one day if everyone gets along. So we need a bit of that. Okay, and now let's get into the All Japan Cup and then we'll go on to Moto2 and Moto3. Fabio Quattararo, another All Japan Cup win. Is Fabio Quattararo still the best rider in the field? All things being equal, Mark after his injuries and with his added age these days, you could still argue he's the strongest man in the field, what he's doing on the 23 bike. But is Fabio actually the best rider in the you know, we, everyone talked about the 96-point gap made up by Peko. That was only because the Yamaha was shite, wasn't it? Like, well, I, I don't remember him being super inconsistent. Obviously, he would have had DNFs that season, but the fact that he was that far ahead in the championship in the first place was remarkable. So let me know, is Fabio Quattro the best rider in the field still? And if you put him on a Ducati, this would not be a conversation. With them guys crashing as much as they are, he'd just be like, yeah, I'm 50 points clear, lads. Don't worry about it. You know, would he be, would he be on Peko's seven race wins? You know, plus he'd be better in sprints. Would he have Martin's sprint record with Peko's Sunday record? A, a part of me thinks that might be the case. Another 10 points. He goes to 112 points uh, in total. Zarco came second. Taka third. Rins fourth. Nobody else finished. The uh, Repsol or the factory Honda boys didn't finish. They stay stranded on in the 30s on the points. So uh, uh, we go to the total points now. Fabio Quattararo 112, as I mentioned. Taka and Zarco equal for second now in 61 points. That one, by the end of the season, we might have to go to a count back. I don't know which way it's going to go on podium finishes and things. Rins, 46 points. Juan near 39. Luca Marini, 33 points. And then, of course, you have Stefan Bradle on seven. Remy Gardner on three. Now, I did mention last week that I thought we are going to see Dovi at some point for Yamaha. I don't know where I heard that. I've not heard anything since. I don't know which, maybe it's a Grand Prix down the, maybe it's coming at the end of the year. Maybe he's going to Valencia or something like that. We are getting Remy in Japan. We're getting Remy in Japan. So there's something there where Yamaha really likes Remy and they like putting him on that bike. I don't know if maybe, I thought at first they were trying to team up for that Pramac ride. Maybe they are. In ca let, we're going to get on to Moto2 and Sergio Garcia, but maybe in case guys like that, they, they can't find someone competitive enough to take that bike after because, we're thinking with Jack and Oliveira short-term signings, aren't they? They're on like last chance kind of guys. So if you need to fill that seat with competitive young riders and all you've got in the waiting in the wings is like a Sergio Garcia who's struggling, if none of these Moto2 guys seem to come to fruition or if you can't poach someone from another manufacturer, uh, maybe Remy's the guy for them down the line or they're thinking down the line they've got a Brattle type guy you know, like a really good, maybe they really like the data they get from him when he gets on the bike. They really like his feedback and they're thinking down the line. This long term could be a really good development rider for us uh, to have testing uh, as often as possible. So I feel like somewhere 
you wouldn't be still putting the guy on the bike all this time. You know, they, they keep putting him on the bike. I know Cal Crutchlow's injured. I know Cal's injured. Otherwise, it would be him. But the fact that they're not, you know, they're not going to Remy and they go, oh, Cal's injured. We tried Remy. Yeah, he was okay. But let's try someone else. They're not doing that. They're sticking with Remy as the replacement for Cal. So something tells me down the line they, they want to keep him a part of that long term because they must be liking what they're getting from him. So promising signs for Remy for a ride post Jack Miller or Oliveira or whichever one doesn't seem to cut it in the end by the end of next season. Let's move on to Moto2. Aaron Canet, there was always the risk here that he was going to fall away pretty quickly, uh, how quickly he went out the blocks, but he, he, he was brilliant, uh, held on to the victory. There was no stopping him. Uh, very good. Once again, if you can't win, just do what Ayagura does. Just do what Ayagura does. He's brilliant. He just finishes as high as he possibly can this week, happened to be second. Uh, and, and probably don't do what Garcia and stuff are doing. So, like, is this title over? Is this is this one done? Look, I know it's 42 points. You can always go mathematically, whatever, and if they turn the form around. Can you see Ayagura, like, he can just go around finishing, like, second, third, fourth for the rest of the season. It's not going to be... Because the same guys... Like, look, you've got Sergio Garcia 42 points behind. Aaron Kanet's gone into 52 points behind with Alonso Lopez. And then Joe Roberts is 50 behind. Fermin Aldegur 62 behind. And then you'd think that's too far anyway along with Jake Dixon at 78 points behind. It's just, it's not going to happen, right? So the only way you can say, like, do you think Aaron Connect can win this world championship? Because I don't. And he's 52 points off. Sergio Garcia is 10 points closer. I, I can see Canet finishing ahead of Garcia in the championship this season. So you have to think the real challenger is now Canet or Lopez, right? I don't see enough from either of them. Okay, so, so you really are relying on Garcia, I suppose, still being 10 points closer than them. And it's just been a nightmare for him. It's been since his injury, it's been an absolute nightmare. You'd have to give him the benefit of the doubt and say that he's had the injury. Would that still be playing up? I don't know. Can you still blame that? Because the pace isn't there. It's fair enough if he's running third and crashes. He's running like tenth, and his crash was just like he got wide out of the edge of the curb and just tried to pull it back across. He almost needed to just sit it up there and cop the fact he was going to lose a couple of positions. So you know where is he at? I don't know. I think this is done. I've got to say, I, th- I mean, I don't want to put a jinx on him, old eye, but I think this is cooked. Stick a fork in it. It's done. Now, look, on the race itself, like I said, Canet was really good. Fermin Aldegur looked like he could challenge Agura, maybe. Probably not Canet, but Agura, but made a made a big mistake running wide, and there will be concerns over it. I've t- I like to give young guys a benefit of the doubt, again, where, you know, it's one bad season or whatever. I say bad, he's still doing okay. But if he wasn't already signed to a MotoGP contract and there was a ride available with what's left to sign sign up, I don't think you'd be that confident in saying, yeah, you'd just give it to him, would you? So he made a mistake, sent himself back to whatever position, ended up recovering pretty well to fourth. Had to make some hard moves to get it done, but did well to get back up to fourth. There's still a talent there, obviously, but like you'd be considering Kanet ahead of him right now. Definitely. Definitely considering Canet ahead of him. But, you know, we'll see how we go on the big boy bikes. The other the other big mover in that one, uh, I looked at the screen at one point. I don't know what happened off the start. Where did he qualify? Seventh. Tony Arbolino qualifying in seventh. I swear I looked at the screen at one point and he was in about 21st position. I don't know what happened. But anyway, after that point, he ended up coming all the way back up and finishing seventh again. What a ride. So I was like, oh, maybe that little run of form's done. We've had two races in Mazzano. That's why he was good. But the pace is actually still there. Obviously, for him to come all the way back, there must have been an issue off the start, mistake, run wide, I don't know. Yeah, brilliant from it. I still think he's, as we come into the end of the season, he's one of the quickest guys out there, I think. Okay, so that's where we stand with Moto2. Moto3, another cracker, another cracker. We had a league group of, I want to say like 11 or so. Yeah, maybe 11 guys. It was chaos. It was chaos up there. And almost everything kind of happened in this one. Another win for David Alonso. Now, if I'm not mistaken, that's eight for the season. One, two. Seven, eight, nine. 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 Now, the all-time record for wins in the category of Moto3 is 13 for Romano Fenati. That's because you've got a guy who was there for about 20 years, right? He's been there since Federation. Now, David Alonso, what's he been there? Two two seasons? Two seasons? He's on 13 now, and he's going to win more. So he's going to end up the record breaker for Moto3 wins. Now... It's hard to imagine anyone beating whatever he ends up on here. 
could end up 15, 16 by the end of the season, right? Five races to go. Can he get to eight? Can he win all five? Like, you know what I mean? You can only get this by being really good in your first season, winning a few, and then dominating your second season because you, you're up then after that. You're going up. There's the, you're not staying in Moto3. Now, the only other way this he's going to get beaten for that is if you get another Fanati type who ends up in Moto3 for years. They're not necessarily that great. Otherwise, you would go up. So that, that's the only other way you can do it. I can't see this getting beaten anytime soon. Whatever he ends up on, he's definitely going to... I can see him winning another two or three at least. Where do you think he'll end up? You know, it's, it's a very good question. But yeah, that won't get beat. Now, again, I said this last week and I'll say it again this week. The video for whichever Grand Prix it was two videos ago, I spoke about why Alonso is so good in these situations. Maybe I'll make a little short or something, you know, and post that. So you can go back and watch that, right? I this that's why I think you know why is he so good in these situations? I did, I've gone on about it so much. They can't beat him when he gets to the front on that last lap. They just have no answer for him. These guys. But yeah, he was brilliant again. Look, I think Vaya probably was the man to beat on the day until his crash, and it was a fast one for Colin Vaya. But his, I mean, his title chances were done anyway. But you know, where does that leave him? Fourth. I still think he'll come second in the world championship, Colin Vaya. I still do. He's uh, 10 points off Olgado, who had a good Grand Prix. Apparently, was he ill or do you have an injury, something? Can't remember, but he was riding under a little bit of duress. And look, he got split from the main group with a few laps to go from the Furusato crash. Left him a gap to the rest of them. And I think he did end up making it up and getting past, uh, he got past Suzuki in the end and being in touch with that group. But it left him in a position where he couldn't challenge for a podium. So that was a bit disappointing for him. But if you get yourself shuffled to the back of the group, that can happen. It was a group of about 11 at one point in the run into the finish, maybe like six, seven laps to go. I say 11, 11th with Kelso. He never really had the pace to be able to move in further up the group because uh, Kelso didn't seem to, he was just like a half, like a bike length off the whole time of the guy just in front of him, but stayed in, stayed in the group, I guess. Uh, but we had Adrian Fernandez with a good result in second and David Munoz third. Piqueras was very good. Luneta was very good. These guys are the ones to watch for next season. Uh, and the other one that's that we need to mention that's probably left himself anyone. I mean, we, we'll talk about it as like, oh, they, oh, they can't win the World Championship. But no one really could. No one really could have before this race. But Ortola and Vaya were the ones that you probably thought they can win races. They can win races this season. If they put enough pressure on and Alonso starts to slip, maybe has a couple of DNFs, they can be maybe in it. One of them too. And with Ortola's three long lap penalties this week, and I've got to say, for doing three long lap penalties, he had a really good race to finish uh, ninth in the top 10. Really good. But with his three long lap penalties, that's now gone. I mean, the Vaya and Ortola are both over 100 points off. So which one of them two comes second? I mean, I'm riding off Olgado here. He still could come second. He's very consistent, Danny Olgado. He always finishes the race. With that in mind, he's obviously still a chance to come second. But really, I, I think on pure pace, I think they'll do a bit quicker, uh, if not a bit more inconsistent. So we'll try and get these videos out nice and quick. Uh, we'll get these out nice and quick. So we're off to Japan now. I think it's Japan, then a week off, I want to say. So Motegi is our last of the triple header. And then we've got a week off before we go to Phillip Island, the big one. Everybody knows Phil Pine's the best circuit on the calendar. It is the big one. A bit spenny these days to fly all the way over there from Europe, from this part of the world, isn't it? It's just so expensive. Qantas need to sort their shit out. All right, so Japan next, then a week off before we get to Phillip Island, and then straight after that, we've got Thailand, and then Malaysia in another triple header. We'll fire these videos out. There won't be much editing involved. It's just quick edit and get the videos out. So enjoy the next uh, few weeks. We'll see you after Japan. Take it easy.